um, the kind of divergence from classical or what is considered orthodox or normative Islam. Many of the early and contemporary, some contemporary expressions of Islam in the black community um, do not um, uh, coincide with people's understanding of classical Islam. And as a result, they, they usually get ignored or totally dismissed outright um, as uh, un-Islamic. And uh, I think to a fault, and, and we'll, we'll examine what you lose when you ignore the historical role and contemporary role of some of these communities. The second thing that, the second impediment to examining this phenomenon is the ignorance of Islam. Uh, a lot of the scholarship that's done on Islam in the black community uh, is either done by um, people who are steeped in black religion or black Christianity or the black church tradition, but they don't really have a fundamental understanding of Islam, so they're not really attuned to recognizing the presence of Islam when it is present, or they're trained in Islamic studies. And they have no understanding of the black experience in America. They have no understanding of how religion has functioned historically and in contemporary black, relig black religious life. And so um, I think don't understand why Islam takes the forms that it does take uh, in the black community. And lastly is exceptionalism. They treat the phenomenon of Islam in, in black America as entirely unique from any other kind of Islamic experience or in, in any other part of the world. And this is really unexplored territory, but um, in, in looking at how Islam comes to America, uh, you start seeing similarities with the way that Islam is introduced into other societies in terms of the kind of syncretism or cultural exchange that takes place between the indigenous culture and the Islamic uh, culture being introduced. So, these four things I just wanted to lay out on the table because hopefully, well first of all, I'm going to talk about some communities that are heterodox, because that's the history and I'll explain to you why. Um, I'm going to try to highlight what are ignored Islamic features of these communities, and I will try to highlight the ways the black experience, uh, understanding the black experience is necessary to understand these communities. And the exceptionalism, there's really not enough time to do a comparative analysis with another culture, so uh, we won't really get into that. So again, these are the four questions that we're going to examine, um, and we'll start with the first. The origins of the historical construction of Islam as a black religion. Um, there are many reasons why Islam comes to be regarded as quote unquote, the black man's religion or as a black religion in America. And one of the first reasons is the idea that Islam is the religion of the ancestors. Um, okay. The second is the idea of Islam as a source of an alternative identity. So on the one hand, you have this idea of Islam as an African religion or as a religion of the African ancestors. And on the other hand, in a strange way, you have the idea of Islam um, presenting an alternative identity to being black in America, as it's historically constructed. The third is the idea of Islam as a defense against racial injustice and a source of racial uplift. And lastly, is the idea of Islam as a religious tradition, which, you know, kind of self-explanatory. Okay. So, as we go into uh, these points, the way that I kind of do this is I use not just the historical record, but cultural memory to illustrate some of these examples. And it's a little ahistorical in the sense that some of the cultural memory uh, comes from contemporary cultural productions. Film, music, hip hop, jazz, uh, just to highlight the continuing uh, legacy of these ideas. These, none of these ideas kind of fade out completely that you can mark, oh, this was from 1913 to 1927, and this was from 1930 to 1975. The, the culture kind of incorporates these ideas and they come up uh, throughout 
uh, the history. So with that, let's look at the idea of Islam as a religion of the ancestors. Um, the first is, the, is in the origins, in the, in the classical Islamic history, the role of African companions to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that, the most famous uh, is Bilal. Bilal is an African uh, Ethiopian slave who was among the earliest converts to accept the message of the Prophet, um, and he became the one who gave the call to prayer, as well as um, a trusted companion. Um, his name and his figure becomes very important in the mid and late 70s to African American Muslims who are looking to reference themselves in classical Islamic history. The second is Islam in West Africa. There's a long-standing and powerful history of African civilizations like Mali and Songhai um, that developed high learning, Timbuktu, um, and these are sources of pride and identity of Islam as an African religion. Finally, it's Islam among slaves brought to America. Now there's some discussion of dispute among the scholars of how many Muslims um, were actually, how many of the slaves were actually Muslim. And there's really no way to tell. Um, but roughly they say, and it, it, you know, to give you how wild the estimates are, they go from 10% to 40% um, that uh, the slaves were brought, 10% to 40% of the slaves came from predominantly Muslim parts of West Africa. So that's as far as they can go. Um, but, so the main question then is the question of the search for roots. And I brought this clip. This is from Public Enemy, the Taishan Nation. I take the Nation of Millions to hold us back. I don't know how many of you, <laughs> we were coming here in the car, how many of you are old enough or were even born when this album came out. But it is a classic album. For people who are like hip hop heads, if you don't have this in your collection, you, 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 you get whacked. So, uh, I'm going to play a clip from the opening track, I mean, a clip from the opening of the track, Night of the Living Basehead, which goes to the fundamental question of historical origin. And we're going to focus there. Have you forgotten that what we were going here, we were going to talk about name? We lost our religion and our culture and God. And many of us, by the way we act, we even lost our mind. Who it is? A man of the state. Have you forgotten? So here's the question. What survived? Now one religious scholar named Al Rabato, sorry, I'm not used to this mind. One uh, religious scholar named Al Rabato says, in the United States, the gods of Africa died. Okay. But what survived? So there's a whole new wave of scholarship looking for survivals, the African survivals uh, among slaves uh, in America. Now the trouble with this is a lot of the uh, Islamic evidence is um, overlooked. The specific Islamic evidence is overlooked because it's just called African, right? Um, the names are just called African, when many of the names have Arabic origins. And so a lot of the uh, slaves who had Arabic names, um, their Muslim identity was concealed by the ignorance of their captors and the ignorance of scholars who just said, oh, they're just all African, right? Like one continent that's so large and it's just one people and that's sufficient enough in identification. And we know that's not. Um, so you had names like um, Bill Ali, or who, or who was also called Ben Ali, or uh, uh, Job, who was Ayub bin Solomon, uh, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman, uh, and these were slaves who had their Arabic names, who tried their very best to pass on that naming practice to their children, although the practice of slavery uh, was so brutal, that was often pre prevented. But in many of the ship manifests that record the slaves as they arrived on the shores of America, their names are given and, um, and they're actually Arabic-derived names indicating that these were in fact Muslims. Um, another thing that survived was the music. 
Again, same problem with the people looking at this, aren't able to kind of pick up on the Islamic nuances of African music or West African music. Um, and there's a perfect example on, on here, I think, that comes up next, that uh, one scholar named Sylvian Darouf identified. And she compares the Adhan, which is the Muslim call to prayer, to a hawa song or work song uh, of, of the slave. Um, and what she, you know, not the exact same tune, but what she's paying attention to is the timbre of the voice and the kind of sustain um, that, that the Arabic call to prayer has. You hear like this kind of holding the note and, and sustaining the note and, and, and raising, you know, going up and down the pitch. And you hear that uh, in the, the Holler song. And, and when I play this clip, first you'll hear uh, a sampling of the uh, Adan, the call to prayer. Then you'll hear the Holler song. And hopefully um, you'll hear the similarity. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Uh, among the uh, slaves. 
for an example of this, a depiction of this, um, I'm going to show two clips from a movie called Daughters of the Dust by Judy Dash, a black filmmaker. It's an excellent movie um, that's set in the Sea Island um, off of the Georgia coast. Um, the, the unique thing about the Sea Island is that these plantations were fairly large. They were rice and sugar plantations. And because they were so large, many times the slaves outnumbered the slave owners. And they, they basically maintained autonomous communities. And the uh, cultural survivors survived much longer because there were so many of them, they basically formed a community as opposed to uh, slavery during in the mainland and in, in Virginia and Maryland where the typical slave household was about four slaves to a family and they were often sold and split up and so there isn't the kind of uh, structure to maintain cultural continuity. Well anyway, the, the scene of this movie is set at the turn of the century and in, in the two clips that I'll show, um, Julie Dash depicts um, I, uh, the descendants on the island are performing the Salat um, and reading, reading the Quran. I mean, this is a fictional portrayal, but it is inspired by the cultural memory. Like I said, I'm kind of jumping back and forth so that, you know, y'all don't follow the on me. <laughs>